Thank you very much. Um, I grew up in, in Cornerbrook, Newfoundland, which is a pretty good place to grow up. I'm not sure about St. John's, because when I grew up, we all distrusted everybody from St. John's. <laughs> what do they say? West Coast, West Coast? Um, I spent the last 24, 24 of the last 34 years of my professional life looking at China. Um, it wasn't the first introduction I ever had to China. And by the way, that's 34 years as the China reform period. When I was very little, uh, my father had a book which was left to him. He was an orphan, and he emigrated to Cornerbrook in the early 1930s. He had a book that was left to him by his father who had died when he was a little boy. And it was because my grandfather had spent some time in a trading company out in China. And it was a book of pastoral pictures of, a, of imperial China of the 19th century. And it was called Sketches of a Vanishing China. And the China that was there at the end of the 19th century vanished completely. Uh, in the tumult of the 20th century. And China since then has gone through lots of changes. And China's the people have known have vanished. And I think that we're actually at a period right now where we're watching another China that we got to know for a long time vanish and be replaced by the modern China. At the end of William's presentation, he had a couple of sentences there. He said, be prepared for a little slowdown in the short term but be confident of the long term. Um, I have to agree with that, but I also want to, I want to um, debunk some of what we're talking about when we're talking about slowdown. The slowdown in China is a re-gearing to a slightly slower gear in absolute term, in relative terms, to 7% or 7.5%. But that is, in fact, huge growth, and growth that matters to you in the resource industry. Because when we talk about slowing to 7.5%, we're talking about a China that is adding $650 billion of aggregate cons consumption and demand, when when it was growing at 10% 10 years ago, it was only adding $200 billion of aggregate consumption and demand. So let's not cry big crocodile tears about this slowdown in China if you're producing resources. Because the resources that China needs to grow at 7% today are three times as many of the resources that it needed to grow when it was growing at 10%. The big challenges of China and the Chinese economy of over, are of overcapacity, misinvestment, uh, a, a mismatch between supply and demand, um, and so on. It's a complicated story, but it's not a story that has anywhere in the script a reduction in the demand for resources. Uh, and that is something that's really important to keep in mind. In 1978, when reform began, one half of 1% of the world's population was poorer than the, pop, than the average population of the Chinese people. One half of 1%. In 2013, 54% of the world's population was poorer than the average of the Chinese population. They've moved up from the bottom quartile to the third, to the second quartile in that short period of time. And they're still growing at the pace they're growing today. It is the most extraordinary story of the last part of the 20th century and the first part of the 21st century. And it is still growing. Uh, and you know, when you look at, at some of the other stories, some of the other myths, I mean, that's a good word that, that Sarah uses, the myths of what's going on in China and you look at them carefully, you realize that we're being misinformed by the headlines of the business news about what's really happening in China. One of the big myths in China is that it's not a consumption economy. It's been driven by exports and, and fixed asset investment. And if we could only get the Chinese to consume more, everything would be fine. 
Well, sure, the Chinese economy is far from being perfectly balanced, and yes, the Chinese government wish to drive forward Chinese consumption. But let's look at where we are today. In the United States, 60 or 70 percent of the GDP is driven by consumption. In China, it's only 36 percent. By the way, I have never found a real economist with the magic number of what's absolutely the correct number at different levels of development. But at 36 percent of Chinese GDP, which is $9.3 trillion, consumption in China is the same size as the German economy. That's just consumption, the same size as the whole German economy. Look at the way their car sales, which are in another massive slowdown. They're only growing 9 percent a year, or 7 or 8 percent a year right now. But they're now the largest car consumption company, country in the world, substantially larger than the United States. Uh, this is a consumption economy. If you look at the, uh, at the amount of money spent on housing and cars and consumption and retail sales, retail sales which have never, not in one single month in the last six years have they fallen lower than a 10 percent year-on-year growth. Um, this is already a very substantial uh, economy, uh, a consumption economy. Um, another one of the myths of today's uh, China is that uh, it's massively overbuilt and we've got empty cities all over the country. Uh, and that, um, and that um, real estate sales are plummeting and prices are dropping through the floor. Prices have abated from a massive increase and they're falling and they have been falling in the last few months at about 1% a year-on-year -year basis, but that was after inflating way beyond the capacity of most Chinese to buy homes. There's an oversupply situation in many cities, but when you look in detail at where there's oversupply, you find maybe a half a dozen cities where you've got more than a year of, of absorption to take place, and most are somewhere between four and eight months of absorption before the market corrects itself. But because so much money has been put into real estate, we've got a little bit of an imbalance at the current time. But when you look at, at, at the forces that are going to use up that space, you can relax unless you're leveraged to the hilt and you need that income every month as a real estate investor. Urbanization, which Sarah talked about a bit. Urbanization is a huge driving force and it's being reinforced by the current government uh, under the leadership on the urbanization side of Premier Li Keqiang. Urbanization means the construction of about a billion, about a billion square meters of housing across the country every year, which is basically adding the housing stock of Australia every year or a third of the housing stock of Canada every year. That's just from the people who are being absorbed into the cities, either by moving or having the cities grow uh, every year. And there's a very large uh, requirement over the next 10 years to replace the shoddy housing that was built in the 1980s and early 90s in the early years of reform. Uh, in fact, um, if, you, if you look at the total amount of demand uh, for housing, uh, we probably will see um, something like, um, something like um, the equivalent of 20 million new homes built every year in China for the next 10 years. So the short-term, short-term, and by the way, the urbanization is a huge driver of resource demand. That's why China produces more than 50 percent of the, of the world's um, cement. It's why every time you, you move somebody from the rural setting to an urban setting, that's an instant, instant increase, uh, instant increase of 13 kilograms of copper, which is in, a, in an average new home. You look at the resource intensity of China compared to today. And by the way, this is not, this is not new news. This is just the China version of old news. If you looked at the resource intensity during the same periods of development of of America much earlier, Canada, Japan, Korea, Taiwan. Uh, every time a country enters development 
in the 20th century, in the 20th century later, it had a higher degree of resource intensity than the countries that went before. And the resource intensity of China on a per capita demand for copper, nickel, almost every commodity is greater than that on a per capita basis than it was in Taiwan and Korea. But other than that, it tracks the same curve if you, if you looked at it economically. And that is not stopping. Okay, so copper demand is going to be huge by China. Nickel demand, obviously in some of these commodities you get into supply demand imbalances, but over the long term the total amount of resources that this economy is going to demand is, is, is truly uh, phenomenal. Um, <clears throat> there are uh, other uh, challenges uh, in the Chinese economy. One is that, and you read about this too, one is about the growing debt in China, um, especially in gray market lending, uh, and the uh, reliance that the, uh, that the economy has, that the, the government has placed on the <coughs> financial system to provide sustained credit to keep economic growth going. Uh, William can talk a lot more with a lot more knowledge about some of the, some of the uh, details about the current um, credit challenges that China is likely to face. Uh, but I can tell you again, looking at it uh, uh, with critical eyes, total Chinese debt has never approached the levels of the debt that most of the developed countries saw in the last five years. <coughs> and uh, and um, it is in no ways threatening the overall um, sustained growth of China. It is also clear that the Chinese government, for the moment, <coughs> puts a greater priority on growth than it does on, on its, its growing debt problem. <coughs> and it is an economy of a sufficient size that it can manage debt in a way that smaller countries uh, cannot. Um, some of those are little, um, I guess, issues that I would, I would put out there to say don't worry about the long term for China. Uh, the long term for China is sustained relatively high rates of absolute growth, <coughs> which, will, um, which will be good for the resource industry in Canada and elsewhere. But I'd like to <coughs> talk for a moment. Is there a glass of water? I'd like to talk for a couple of minutes about other things about change in China, and it, which is why I say that we are on, I think, we're in transition for a new China that's coming out of, of uh, today's world. Uh, Xi Jinping, uh, who is now uh, the uh, president of China uh, and the sec general secretary of the party, uh, has collected in his hands more power than any other leader since Deng Xiaoping. Uh, and he is demonstrating a determination to change the course of China in many very important ways. One <coughs> is that he is tackling corruption, which is a corrosive problem in China and threatens the legitimacy of the regime. Privately, in party meetings, he has, he, <coughs> at the time of the 18th Party Congress, uh, <coughs> the plenum last year that Sarah talked about, Privately, he was saying to some of, of, uh, of the participants, he said, if we do not tackle corruption now, there may never be a 19th Party Congress. And if you look at what is happening in the anti-corruption campaign right now in China, we have never seen anything quite like it. More than 20 ministerial level people have lost their jobs and have been tried or awaiting trial. He's going after the former um, security king of China who ran all the law enforcement agencies uh, under previous regimes, a guy called Zhou Yongkang. Uh, he's taken apart the uh, senior management of PetroChina who were associated with Zhou Yongkang. We've seen over 200,000 cases of anti-corruption brought against officials. We are seeing an enormous effort to change the culture of Chinese business. So much so that he has said that officials who park their families abroad, their wives and kids abroad, 
uh, and continue to work in China will no longer be eligible for promotion in the state system. Uh, he's ramped down massively um, the, the um, use of, of entertainment uh, in China, and the cultural change is absolutely palpable. And he, of course, um, has used this not only to deal with the corrosive problem of corruption, but also to help consolidate power uh, himself. But it's not just on, on the change in that culture that he is making change. If you look back to last November, there was a very major announcement at the time of the third plenum of the 18th Party Congress uh, called a 60-point decision, where he laid out some of the other structural changes that they were planning to make in China, from social change, doing away with the one party, with the one child policy, uh, adjusting the hukou system, wherein the mobility of people in China was severely limited, and the people, the, the, the floating population, the, the workers from outside the cities who had come to work in the cities in construction and real estate, couldn't become citizens of those cities and couldn't educate their kids. Um, and this was a, a major social issue, uh, a major mobility issue, are now being relaxed and dealt with in a way that is going to fundamentally change uh, social mobility and structural uh, um, mobility in China. Uh, SOE reforms, um, which um, were uh, set out in basic principles, we're now beginning to see what that might entail, and they are very, uh, very serious and very um, important reforms. Uh, in, the, in an earlier regime, when Jiang Zemin was president and Zhu Rongji was premier, uh, Zhu Rongji kind of ran the, ran the economic side, Jiang Zemin kind of ran the political side, and SOE reform was begun. And the objective in those years was to reduce the total number of national SOEs to a manageable 160 or 180 SOEs and let the others become privatized or go out of business or whatever. And it was at that time that we saw the emergence of the great telcos and the great oil companies and so on begin to really operate as commercial organizations, as commercial companies, and begin to professionalize their management uh, and run themselves like international companies. However, during the, the, the regime that came between uh, under Hu Jintao, uh, um, we saw basically SOE reform stop, and, and now under Xi Jinping, we're watching it begin again in a very serious way, where the effort will be to get rid of large numbers of smaller and local SOEs and change the culture of the senior SOEs. And a lot of, as, as William said, a lot of the senior SOEs are the investors in, in internationally in Canada and elsewhere. Uh, and I sit on the board of a Canadian branch of one of those SOEs, and I'm already seeing some of the change in the culture that's coming. One of the models that will be applied in some sectors will be that the SOEs themselves will become more of investment companies and the operating companies will become, um, will become public companies, market-driven companies with larger, uh, with larger participation of the private sector, either through private investments or through becoming, or through the state becoming a minority shareholder in public market companies. Uh, you may have seen the Sinopec retail deals where they brought in a bunch of private investors uh, just these past few weeks, which will mean the um, gas stations and, and convenience stores that, that are on all the highways and, and in the streets of China will now no longer become controlled as an old state-owned enterprise used to be, but will be run like a mixed stock company in which Sinopec is simply a shareholder in what could, be, could well be listed separately as a retail company. Um, you're going to have to signal to me when you want me to stop because I just keep on going. Um, so, um, and, and uh, an additional area of very significant reform in China that's been announced uh, last year as part of this is tax reform. Um, going to a system completely borrowed from, the, from uh, North America on uh, real estate tax, where, um, where homeowners will pay tax on their, on their homes, which wasn't the case before. The main source of local government uh, 
uh, revenue, or a very significant source of local government revenue, used to be the sale of land, uh, which led to abusive practices in the grabbing of land from, from the agricultural classes, handing it over to developers, developers pay the cities money, which they can then use, and then the developers uh, build, big, uh, build big developers, and the Local governments were kind of addicted to this. They had to get more land, to sell more land, to have enough uh, resources, have enough income, have enough revenue so that they could provide other municipal services. Now they are gradually rolling out a system which will become national, which is based on the same kind of uh, uh, real estate uh, taxation that we have here, where local governments will be financed by ongoing investment, and they won't have to continue the practices that they've had in the past. Um, as I said, the social changes that are being made in, in terms of the reform of the HUCO system, the, the residential uh, registration system, and the end of the one-child policy are really, for modern China, uh, quite radical. Um, I, I don't really know um, what China is going to evolve into. I've watched China evolve from a totally state-controlled, uh, state-owned economy to an economy where today more than half of its GDP is driven by private enterprise. Uh, William and I were talking during the break about a company uh, whose leadership we both know, a company called Fosun uh, in Shanghai, which has been modeled, which is now a basically a $20 billion investment company, uh, managed uh, much like um, Berkshire ha um, Hathaway. Uh, in which there is absolutely no state-owned money, uh, and they have uh, a $4 billion pharmaceutical company, they have a $4 billion uh, real estate company, uh, they are actively involved in uh, almost all areas of economic activity, uh, and they're extremely successful uh, in terms of the profits they generate. Um, Sarah mentioned Alibaba, Alibaba, who, which is now uh, I guess the largest IPO in the history of the world, uh, built an extraordinary um, successful uh, internet company over a period of 20 years, uh, and again, without any uh, state-owned uh, interference uh, whatsoever. Uh, these are the champions of the new China, and we are going to see more and more of them emerge as China becomes a much more mixed economy an economy where even the state-owned companies become uh, much more active uh, as real corporate uh, players in the global economy. I personally anticipate uh, that we will see uh, many of the large state-owned enterprises uh, become a majority non-state-owned over the next 10 years and listed both in China and in overseas market, markets. Um, if any of you haven't gone to China, You've just got to go. Because it's only by going to cities like Shanghai uh, and Beijing, but Shanghai and Shenzhen and Guangzhou, where you realize, where you get a sense of what this place is. The size of the place, the degree of consumption, the, the way people act, the rise of the middle class, all of which are changing China so fast that the government of China is working hard to try to catch up. For the resource industry, I'll, I'll end where I began. Um, I am convinced that 25 years from now, we'll be sitting in it, we'll be standing, I'll be dead, but we'll be standing in a conference like this, and we'll be talking about last quarter's slowdown in Chinese economic growth, which will then be 4% or 3%. But the 4% or 3% of that growth then will be larger in terms of its contribution to global con consumption and demand than today's 7%. And at that point, China will be 40% or 30% of the global economy, and we'll still worry about it. But I hope by that time, you know, we will have gotten used to, you know, and we're watching our federal government here, I used to be part of it, um, grapple with, do we want it, do we not want it, do we want it, uh, resource investment. Um, Sarah kindly congratulated the government, sort of, for ratifying the Foreign Investment Protection Act. It should have been ratified two years earlier. Um, 
the, uh, the announcement on we're not quite sure we want Chinese investment in oil sands that Harper made when, uh, when he approved the Nexon deal uh, has confused uh, the Chinese investors. They don't know whether Canada is really open for investment in our resource industry because they hear conflicting, uh, conflicting words out of Ottawa and the provinces. This is something that frustrates Christy Clark in BC a lot, uh, and it's something that should frustrate uh, Newfoundlanders as well. Uh, it, it, is, it is necessary for us as a country to give a clear and unequivocal message to China investors that we want their investment in their resort. We want them to behave when they get here. We want them to live by our rules, and if not, we'll take back their rights. But as long as they live by our rules and support our communities and help us develop our resources, they're welcome here. And they're not getting that clear message today uh, from Canada, and it's, and it's up to us to encourage our governments at all levels to give that message uh, to them. I'm going to stop. I would love to take questions and have a conversation with you, but I gather that's not in our current plan for the morning. But I'd, I'd love to talk with you over lunch or the breaks and whatever. Thank you very much. I think we probably have time for one question. You want me to take questions? All right. If there are any questions, I'll take questions or comments or anything else. What do you want to know about China? All right, well, so much for questions.